Yo, 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 welcome to Crate 808. And today we have a very special guest joining us, a woman who's worked with and managed bona fide rap legends from ODB, RZA, Q-Tip, and a tribe called Quest, the first Asian woman of hip hop. Yes, the fearless and inspirational Sophia Chang is in the house. How are you doing, Sophia? Hi, thank you so much for that introduction. I'm wonderful, all things considered. Thank you. 2020 is a test. 2020 is a test. Major test. <laughs> well, I'm going to kick off. I want to jump in. I mean, you've got a new book out, a memoir. You have a storied history in hip hop. But um, before we dive in, I have to ask you what I ask everyone, Sphere. What's the least hip hop thing you've done in the last 24 hours? Everything. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't live in hip hop like that anymore. I'm 55. I aged out of hip hop a long time ago. Mm -hmm. I'm not, um, I listen to old music. I listen to old hip hop. Mm -hmm. I'm not relevant, but a hip hop thing that I do. I mean, what I would say is that, you know, I say my name is Sophia Chang and I was raised by Wu Tang. Mm. So hip hop taught me a lot right? Hip hop yeah. taught me how to honor and voice my anger. Hip hop taught me about loyalty. Hip hop taught me about ride or die. So all of those things inform who I am, mm -hmm. but I'm not au courant. You know, I don't have my finger on the pulse anymore. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. Cause I don't really know what hip hop is that way. Mm -hmm. I just know that just like Shaolin Kung Fu and Chan Buddhism, hip hop is part of, um, hip hop raised me. Yeah. I think, I think that echoes a lot with the people who listen to our pod. So a lot of nineties heads, a lot of people don't listen to the new stuff as much, but I feel like it's in your everyday judgments, be it politics, be it religion, be it just the way you live your life. I feel like, mm -hmm. It's kind of ingrained in us. So I had to ask if there was anything there, but man, this memoir. No, I, I, I thank you. <laughs> I look, I appreciate the question. I would say that, um, you know, I was also raised, I wasn't just raised by Wu-Tang and rappers. I was also raised by hip hop feminists mm -hmm. and am to this day. For sure. And I don't, and you know, I don't, I don't think that we can actually separate the two, yeah. right? So women like Joan Morgan and Kierna Mayo and Dream Hampton, mm. all of these extraordinary writers and thinkers who were shaping the culture back then, they are my friends to this day, you know, and continue yeah. to educate me to this day. But I'm so glad you enjoyed the book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, seriously, I, I, I really did. And um, talking of the book, the memoir, uh, The Baddest Bitch in the Room, I mean, it's it could because we know of you generally anyway, just to see a memoir like that come out and get reported from the front lines. I'm going to go into why I think that's vital for hip hop, really. But for the listeners out there and for myself who haven't checked the book maybe right now, could you break down uh, why you wrote the book and really what, what the book, what the journey of the book is about? Absolutely. Hang on, break for a second. Absolutely. Yeah, no worries. Um, so the title of the book, yeah, there we go. The there title go. of the book is the baddest bitch in the room. And I'll tell you a little bit about how I came to the name, the name. I was actually describing other women in my life. Uh, I was at the second annual black girls rock gala, which was founded by DJ, well, model turned DJ turned philanthropist, Beverly Bond. Mm -hmm. And she was honoring Beth Ann Hardison, who's a friend of mine, who was a long time. She was a model. She was a, uh, m a manager of models and, a, and is a fashion activist. And with Joan Morgan, whom I previously mentioned, and my girlfriend, Sam Martin, I just remember looking at them and thinking, man, my girls are the baddest bitches in the room. <laughs> Beautiful and elegant and brilliant and independent and in, you know, in the midst of cultures and shaping cultures. And that was back in 08. And then, you know, it kind of morphed into, it kind of morphed into something that um, 
became something that I said, because I used to say I was raised by Wu-Tang more than I said that I was the baddest bitch in the room. And then I was, as I was writing my memoir, it kind of catalyzed for me that that was really what the title of the memoir should be. My agent actually recommended it. Mm. What it means is um, it's, it sounds competitive and mm -hmm. I get that, but it's not, it's not like we walk in the room and go, I'm more this than you. I'm more that than you. Mm. It's really about owning our own power, right? For sure. As women who are almost exclusively of color, who are over 40, over 50 for a number of us in a world where we get little to no indication that we are powerful or beautiful, mm -hmm. right? It, um, and the reason that I wrote the book was in, so in 2014, I was working at Universal Music Group. I, haven't, I hadn't worked at a major label ever. Wait, mm -hmm. no, I had. Um, I worked at Atlantic in like 1989. Yeah. So I got this job and that by this time I'm 50, right? I'm on the brink of 50 and I have my own children and I start to mentor a number of young women who are literally young enough to be my children. They're in their early twenties, fresh out of college. And it occurred to me that my experience as a working mother, as a single mother mm. could be beneficial. And Cheryl Sandberg's Lean In came out and I read that and I definitely learned some lessons from it, but it was very clear to me that that was not written by me nor for me, so to speak. Yeah. And so I originally conceived of it as a lean in for women of color. It was thematic. It had chapters, different chapters. And then after I got the book deal and started working with editors and shaking it, it became apparent that really the best way to tell the story was as a traditional chronological memoir. Mm. Um, now I have been being told by my friends for years, oh my God, you've got these amazing stories and you've had such a crazy life. You should really write a memoir. Mm. And I just couldn't wrap my head around it because I, it just felt like an exercise in narcissism. Yeah. It felt yeah. like me saying, Hey, this is my super cool life. And I know these really famous people. And the truth of it is my life hasn't been filled with a bunch of celebrities. Um, and also who cares? Yeah. about my story. Somebody else should tell that story that could tell much more exciting stories than me. But once I started mentoring these women, it occurred to me that sharing my experience could be beneficial to others. Mm -hmm. So when I could take it off of me and that it could actually be that I was in service of others, that's when I, that's when it made sense to me because I worked with Paul Simon in 1987. I know what fame is. Mm. I know the price that you pay. And I never wanted to be famous. And so for me, it was an actual abdication of my anonymity, which I had cherished. There was a time when I scrubbed my images off of Google. I did not want people to know who I was. I was always behind the scenes. Mm. And I decided to step in the spotlight because I realized that I could be of service to others. That's the only reason that I did it. I did not do it for self-aggrandizement, self-congratulation, mm. self-enrichment. I don't need any of that. Mm. I did it because I can help others, but women in particular, women of color, even more specifically. That's really interesting because that feels like your whole career and we are going to go into like these amazing stories, but just so I can say now, if your, your whole career seems at the service of people who like, who may not have been able to tell their story, who may not have been able to express themselves in such an incredible way that it changed the world. And I feel like, as you were serving those guys to help them with that platform to, to lift themselves, I feel like this could do similar things. I'm just talking about the first, even like the first sentence of the book. I'm uh, from an immigrant family as well in the UK. Oh, where's your family from original? From Please? India, from India, okay. from, from Punjabs, from the North. Um, and there's something in your book where you were like, we don't say I love you like white <laughs> families. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I am in. This is this woman gets exactly where I'm from. So we didn't say that. We don't. We don't. We, we, don't, we, we don't say that. Yeah. And we, yeah. I mean, we didn't say I love you until my father, God rest his soul, was diagnosed with cancer, mm. which was close, you know, much, much, much later in life. And now I say to my mother, I love you. And she says it back. But that's not how we talk. I mean, how about this? Did you a girlfriend of mine, Korean American, also first gen, right? Child of immigrants. She said, you know, we know nothing about the interior lives of our parents. And she's right. Mm. Did you ever talk to your parents about their dreams yeah. or their fears or what makes them happy? Yeah. <laughs> it's true. It's true. 
they just laugh it off or go, ah, no, we didn't have time. We didn't have time to think like that. Or, or, yeah, because all we're doing is we're busting our asses in this it. foreign yeah. land, speaking that's this it. foreign tongue with these foreign people, trying to make sure that you guys are good, meaning you guys, your our children. Yeah, and that's what's beautiful about this book because although it could have been written by people that uh, hip hop to me was alien as a kid, so I was going into an alien uh, culture, but this hits home in the fact that. You, you, I mean, one of the things that you really nail is the fact that when you looked at anything in life in in the Western world, it was always through a white prism no of thought or, or perspective or principles or ethics or whatever it is. There was, it was always from a white uh, outcome or mm-hmm. outlook. Whereas with this, when I'm reading this book, it's like, wow, not only is it vital we have the history of hip hop, of the Wu, of RZA, of ODB, of Tribe Called Quest, all these people that you have worked with. When I, uh, a lot of people nowadays rewrite this kind of history because it's, to those, it's so long ago. It's the 90s. It's so long to them. To me, it's like, oh, Sophia was on the front lines. Sophia came from a background I can get down with. I can understand. And also feeling your almost anxieties of being in that world where meth and rizza and like all these kind of giant figures are there Mm -hmm. and i would love to go into like your journey towards even when you first heard the woo like what what was what was your journey towards even getting to listening to the woo and then i was gathering it was the it was the demo you heard first man what what was that like what was that like getting to that well there was already a buzz around it right Mm. rizza at that point known as Prince Rakim, he's always been a multi-dimensional thinker, right? When people mm-hmm. talk about playing three-dimensional chess, he is a chess player, chess master, and yeah. he certainly lives his life that way. Um, so he had already created a buzz around it. So all of the A&R people around throughout the industry got the Wu-Tang demo simultaneously. This was not special to me. Yeah, And, um, it had three songs on it, Protect Your Neck, Tears, and Method Man. And it was handwritten. And at the bottom of it, it said Prince Rakim. And I remember the phone number to this day. Wow. And we all listened to it and we all thought it was incredible. But RZA asked for a non-exclusive deal, which none of us could grant, right? A non-exclusive deal means that you sign Wu-Tang Clan. Every time a label signs an, a group, they have the exclusive right to then release the solo albums. They, they're not... They're not obligated to, mm. but they have the exclusive rights should they want to. And RZA infamously to people in the industry asked for a non-exclusive deal. I don't know that anybody ever got it before him. Mm. I don't know that anybody ever got it since him, but I know that after him, every group was like, I want a non-exclusive where <laughs> everybody was like, oh my God, RZA started this precedent. Yeah. Um, and it was a stroke of genius. Mm. So I wasn't able to sign it, but I do remember listening over and over and thinking, nine, nine. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and of course, also being thunderstruck by his production. Yeah. I'd never heard anything like his production before. None of us have. Yeah. And he really changed the game. You know, I'm I'm not a musicologist and I'm not a music critic and I'm not a producer. So I don't mm. have very elegant language around it. I just remember it feeling gritty. Yeah. Yeah. And grimy. And so quintessentially New York, you know, the New York that I knew and loved. It Mm. wasn't the New York of Woody Allen movies that was Gershwin, you know, and Park in the Upper West Side. It was this very kind of, you could almost taste it and smell it and feel it through his music Mm. in addition to hearing it. Yeah. So that was mind blowing. And then I was able to meet him. When, but I will, I will tell you that when we all heard it, we all knew they were going to blow up. There was no mystery around that, mm. right? And again, I was not unique in that. It's not like, oh, I got it before anybody else. I knew it before anybody else. For sure. Not at all. Yeah. Everybody knew. <laughs> so then he was shopping a group because he has a non-exclusive. He's exclusive. He's shopping a group called the Grave Diggers with uh, Fruquan mm. Poetry and Prince Paul. Prince Paul, yeah. From, obviously, the mm. genius behind De La Soul. Mm. And this group I wanted to sign, I didn't end up getting it, but I did get to meet him. And the meeting, the first time we met, it was fantastic. We had lunch. I remember what I was wearing. I remember what I ate. I remember what the weather was. I remember the last thing he said to me, you know, there are certain meetings and moments that stay with you for the rest of your life. And Mm. I knew when we met that we would be friends. Um, We just had this instant connection. And I would say it was probably 
intellectual first mm-hmm. and spiritual. I think I've known Risen in past lifetimes. Wow. That, that's how immediate the connection was. And, you know, he's the godfather of my children. He is one of my closest friends to this day. Mm. Um, and he's been with me through, you know, since 1993, he's been with me through mm. everything that I've gone through. So it is very hard for me when I talk about Wu-Tang Clan to separate the men from the music. In fact, I'm much more comfortable talking about the men, the people, my friends, mm-hmm. than I am about the music because, again, I'm not that person, right? Yeah. I, I'm not interested in talking about this sample here, that sample there, this lyric, that lyric, this album, this solo one as opposed to that solo one. Mm. The only thing that I'm an expert on is who they are to me. Yeah. That's it. And that's what the book is really good, though, Sphere. As oh, in I like, hope so. Yeah, because, again, the vitality of something like this, it is becomes also the fact that you have um, an insight into what Method Man, into what ODB, into all these guys, like what they actually are like behind the closed door. So I would love to know. I mean, the, the first meeting with RZA sounds amazing. Do you remember that time when you felt like, wow, I'm really in the inner sanctum right now? That's or a good like, question. Yeah, like like when you when you felt like, wow, I'm 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 looked after. I'm part of this group. Was, was I think I felt that almost immediately. Oh, really? So I met RZA first and then they happened to be record. And then he invited me. I probably invited myself. I like, once I met RZA, I was like, (laughs) (laughs) I'm not letting you go. Um, And I didn't have a day job and I had a pretty lucrative consultancy. So I had the freedom to move around. Mm. So I would just, you know, they were in the studio, they were at firehouse studios, which was not, uh, which was relative. I know I did have a day job. I was at jive. Um, Mm. It was relatively close to Jive, and I remember going in there, and I don't think I wrote about this in my memoir, but the studio, you know, studios can be mayhem, right? Because everybody wants to be in the studio, which I don't understand, but (laughs) it's crowded. There are people everywhere, and um, it's full of smoke. It's full of people. It's loud, and I see meth, and he is so clearly focusing on writing in one of those black and white composition notebooks. Mm, mm. And he looks up and he sees me and he just yells at everybody. Yo, that's Sophie Chang. Somebody get up and give her a seat. That's Sophie Chang. What's the matter (laughs) with you guys? He was so upset that they weren't getting up to give me a seat. That's amazing. And that, you know, meth of all of Wu-Tang and frankly of all the rappers and frankly of all of the friends that I have is probably the most demonstrative of his love and our Mm. friendship, which I really appreciate. And again, being, you know, a minority within a minority, like a petite Asian woman walking into a world that is not my own and not of my making, right? So that's Mm. a tremendous privilege. And him creating a space for me and making me feel very safe. I mean, the way that I open my audio book is with that story of Method Man in the studio. So Mm. You know, Matt was the first person to ever say to me, so if your family, I mean, I don't know if your family ever talked like that. We didn't talk like that. Because yeah, again, yeah. English is not my parents' first language. So they weren't mm. like, oh, Sophia, you know, John, he's like family. We didn't say that. And the first time I heard it was from Matt's lips. And it was really, it, it resonated very deeply with me. Mm. So there, they made me feel welcome immediately. They mm. made me feel loved and cared for immediately and i'm really really grateful for that Mm. and i think they also knew that i loved and respected them deeply and that i was always there to help Mm. and to give i was never there to take yeah right i wasn't there to try to let me get a verse in you know let me get some of this let me get some we that's just not who I am. Mm. Um, and so I think there was a mutual love and respect there. You know, at the end of the audiobook, I have some bonus content and mm. this conversation with Ghost, he, it was so beautiful. He was like, so if it's 25 years later and you're sitting right here with me on the couch, yeah. that means something. Yeah. Half those, you know, half, in fact, he said, I don't talk to any of those people anymore. None of them. I don't wow. know their names but you're right here with me. That's incredible. And that really speaks tremendously to our friendship. I don't have ghost phone number. 
Mm. I couldn't get them on the phone if I tried. Mm. That's also not what it's about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. But, but when we see each other, if that's what he said, he said, it's just like the first day. Yeah. Man, you're talking about ghosts there. There was a moment speeding. I got really excited just reading like these little bits. I didn't want these passages to end, man. That's how good this book is because it was like – because it's a trip to these kind of worlds, um, it was really hard for me to know like what was happening in the world in a little village where I was because it's only certain people who are going to tell me. But there was one thing in there where you were talking about that Iron Man album shoot there oh, for, yeah. for the for the cover, right? And I was like, first of all, how many wallabies? Like, they're, they're, it, so it, many. It's so, so many, many. But and we shot it. Um, so there's this place called Chelsea Market in New York City. Oh right. That is this, it used to be maybe a, a, a whatever it was was industrial, and it's mm-hmm. huge. It's on like 15th and 9th, and it spans like a whole avenue and a whole city block. Mm. And it was super industrial. And we shot there before it actually became Chelsea Market. And it was brick and it was cement floors and it was dusty and it was dirty. It was grimy. Yeah, yeah. And we set up, you know, uh, we, we set up this lab, right? Mm. And it was so much fun. I just remember laughing. I mean, being around Ghost and Ray and Cap, mm. particularly in that era, was just a lot of fun. And yeah. I remember the wallabies yes <laughs> and i remember the color combinations and him being very specific about what he wanted the color combinations to be and ah. you know that's the that's the wally king i was also there now i oversaw that shoot because i was a general manager of razor sharp but i was mm. also there for the shoot for uh cuban links oh, i epic. i visited when they were shooting cuban links and i just remember there was a big w behind them and yeah. they're standing table and it's red and white mm. and rays in the center and all the guys are there they shot that i want to say at sun studios in mm. s- actually bleaker and broadway like i i have very distinct memories of that and just walking in everybody being like so and um <laughs> yeah those were special special moments and I, I look back and I just think I was so fortunate to be able to be there when history was being made or being mm. in the studio when they're making records, mm. you know, the, because you're in the, you are in the presence of genius mm. Mm. at the height of their creativity. Yeah. It's when incredible. they're writing and they're thinking like, mm. I've never been to a studio where Meth wasn't writing. He's always writing. Wow. Jizz is different. Jizz doesn't write in the studio. Jizz writes at home and then he comes. To the ah, studio, right? interesting. So I don't actually ever remember watching Jizz write meth all the time. Yeah. Jizz does his, his lab, his, his is in his brain and he does that outside of the studio. That's interesting. I was just thinking there about did you guys even, was there like a, a, a feeling of, wow, we are making history right now? Or was that more retrospective? Or did you know at the time when you're doing Cuban I don't links? think I knew, but I think they did. Yeah. I, I think that I was probably too naive to understand. Look, what I knew, again, like I said about the whole industry, was that they were going to be huge. I don't mm. think I framed it in terms of, holy shit, I'm here making history. Like I mm-hmm. was the a r person who oversaw the recording of the scenario remix, right? Because yeah. the man, Sean Carousel, God rest his soul, who had signed a Tribe Called Quest had moved to Cali. So I was overseeing the remix. Mm-hmm. I didn't put any of it together creatively. That record had already been made, right? Mm. But I was the one that was kind of cajoling and getting all the moving parts together and booking the studio. Uh, I mean, when you're in there and you hear people go into the booth, you're like, oh my God, this is incredible. But I don't Mm. think you have a sense of history until you have the distance. Yeah. I am sure that RZA knew exactly what the impact would be of what he was doing, as well as the guys. Yeah. I don't think that I was... uh, prescient enough to understand it to the depth that they did. I knew that it was important, but I don't think I knew that I was there for mm. moments of making history. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because then the knowingness of everything comes along when, again, in the book, when you're reading about the fact when you're in the China, in the mountains in China with RZA, yeah. and you realise this all stuff, there's, there's, there's a power that's kind of guiding all of this. Because could you please tell the listeners about when you went, parked up and RZA, said, turn around, Soph, look behind you. Like that story, yeah. please tell me that story. That I knew that I was making history. I knew that I was making history when I introduced, you know, look, 
I totally shun my culture when I'm young, mm. right? I don't want to train in Kung Fu. I don't like the Korean food. I don't like any of that. I want to be white. Mm. I hear the message and it really opens my eyes. I moved to New York. I get embraced by hip hop. I meet Wu-Tang Clan. They love my culture. They revere it. They respect mm. it. They do not fetishize it, mm. right? Mm. And um, so then I start training in Kung Fu with a 34th generation Shaolin monk because of their influence. I introduce Wu-Tang Clan to an actual Shaolin monk. I knew I was making history there. Yeah. And then I produced this tour in 1999, August 1999, to go to Shaolin Temple. And Riza comes on that tour. And here I knew I was making history. Mm. Take mm. Riza to the Shaolin Temple, where he becomes the first artist in its 1500 year history to perform before its hallowed red doors. All right. Wow. On that same tour, then now, now Shaolin Temple, even in 99 was a huge tourist attraction, huge, very mm. commercialized. Mm. Then we go North, I believe it is to the province of Hebei where Wu-Tang, um, Udang San, where Wu-Tang Mountain and Wu-Tang Temple are um, mm. located. It is pristine pristine it is a mile high mountain we wow. take a fucking bus to a train to cars we go up this winding road i'm pregnant wow. i'm nauseous as hell um Jeez. i'm in and we get to the top of the mountain and the whole trip is a war oh excuse me no no not at all not at all um and the whole trip Riza war gear either a USA Shaolin Temple t-shirt or a Shaolin monk's uniform. You know, he was very deferential. For sure. And wanted to represent. And so we went to the top of Wu-Tang Mountain and we finally got to get out of the van. So I was like, oh my God, let me out. I'm nauseous, I'm pregnant. <laughs> and we get out and again, it is pristine. And there is nothing there that speaks to the 20th century, the 19th century, the 18th century. I mean, it could have been mm. Tang Dynasty, right? Yeah. Everything is old and ancient and beautiful and the skies are blue and we're surrounded by all of these fantastic mountains mm. and I'm a total shutterbug. So I was taking all of these pictures mm. and um, Riza says, so take a picture, take a picture. And I was like, okay. And I took a picture and uh, he said, look, and I said, what? And he said, look behind me. And all I saw behind him were mountains. And he said, look, so it's a W and the mountains wow. form this W. And that's, you know, Riza is a director. I think he's been a director from when he was very, very young, right? Mm. That's how his mind works. Again, in this kind of 360 sense, mm. Riza hears, obviously. For sure. Um, but he also sees in a way that other people don't see. He has a very unique lands literally on the world and figuratively yeah. on the world. And it was a stunning, stunning moment. You know, we're sitting at the top of, you know, we take this tram up and we're sitting at the top of this mountain and I'm looking at my husband, quote unquote, we weren't formally married, but that's what mm. I call him, the 34th generation Shaolin monk. And I'm looking and next to him is his best friend who is the abbot of Wu-Tang clan. And that's crazy. I did that. Yeah, that's crazy. I made that moment, and that's just, and that's what I mean. There's, there's these moments in your story journey that are just like, um, well, for want of a better word, inspirational. As in, like to see I where you so. came from. To Thank you. See where, yeah, like for this pod, like we talk to legends, and we're like, wow, it's amazing we talk to them. But then you look at the history of hip hop, and you're like, people have been doing this. People have done it. People have gone out there, showed a lot. You're so proactive. It's incredible. I was like, I felt lazy like, listening to how you just went about yeah. your thing. I was like, oh my God, I should have really just gone for it. But, um, but no, I mean, and, and, you know, I think in the end, the most beautiful results is when you do it for the love. Yeah, absolutely. And it's really important. It was important to me in writing my memoir that I wasn't going to talk about partying with Wu-Tang Clan. First of all, I don't. I don't think any of them would want to party with me. None of them were like, oh, so she's so much fun. Let's get her to come to the club. They they do not think about me like that, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm kind of like the cleaner, the fixer, the glue. I'm the one that comes mm. in and I make sure that they have their towels and all that stuff. You know, I'm not the tour manager. Or, you yeah. know, are you good? You need anything to eat? Mm -mm -mm. Um, but I wanted the part that I wanted to show, and frankly, the only side of Wu-Tang Clan that I am qualified to talk about is, mm. again, who are they 
as friends, yeah, as people to me. And I really wanted to show a side of them that I think people haven't seen before. I have this really smart friend. His name is Julius Ona. He is a Nigerian American director. He mm. made a movie called Luce, L-U-C-E last year. It came out last summer. Mm -hmm. I saw him being interviewed and he said, you know, I believe that every person deserves access to the full spectrum of humanity. And I think that any wow. of us who live on the margins are very clear that we, none of us have been granted access to the full spectrum. And that if we want access to the full spectrum, we have to take it, which isn't fair. Yeah. And I was trying, you know, I know there have been countless interviews with Wu-Tang Clan. So they've been able to tell their story. There mm -hmm. have been countless articles written about them. So other people have told their story, mm -hmm. but only I can talk about my story with them. And that's why I engaged them the way that I did for the audio book. And mm. we relived those moments together. Mm. And I really wanted to humanize them in a way that only I could do, not because yeah. nobody else can humanize them, but meaning only I can tell my story with Wu-Tang Clan. Absolutely. I mean, they could too, but I did. I did it. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's unique, though. It's, it, that's the whole point of this uh, of of uh, books and just any kind of historical telling of stuff like this. It comes from a p opinion, and it matters. Like your opinion matters. Like it really does matter. And uh, be it to women, be it to uh, minorities, be it to whoever. I think hip hop fans should go out and check this book because it's it's the culture man it's where it started and you know another thing i really loved about it and we've not even got to odb and stuff like that but the one thing i did love about it is how it stemmed not from hip-hop you, your life was very different and you didn't grow up in that and you, you know you got into punk and the the joe is it joey ramone you met at the front of the like those stories the the ramone stories and stuff like that like yeah yeah oh, it's yeah. just it's just a nice context to have for the culture that we're all in it's good to know that there's been a past to it. There is going to be a future to it. But this telling of it tells me, you know, it just gives me more, well, love for the culture and, and for people in it. So, yeah, Soph, man, you you, you absolutely smashed it. Um, one thing I have to ask you then, uh, we have a playlist of, uh, and, and, and I know this has been majorly woo chat, but the, the, the memoir is more than just that. But uh, we do have a playlist of uh, slept on Wu-Tang bangers. So, because they have so much music, do you think there's like a track that you think maybe deserves just a little bit more love? And it could be from their solo stuff or it could be from like their, their uh, collective stuff, but is there something that, that hits home? There's a song that came out on a soundtrack. I wish I remember the soundtrack. Mm. It's Ghost and Ray called Heaven and Hell. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I loved that song. Yeah. When it came out, I listened to it nonstop. I mm. found it so touching. Yeah. I don't, for me, there is no MC that emotes with more profundity and honesty than ghost mm. when i hear him talk about his brothers yeah you know yeah God the souls and when he talks about his mother mm. in all that i got is you wow. you know i remember the first time i heard that song i literally cried yeah. i think he has such a massive heart yeah and when he rhymes it comes through so clearly you know it's like he wears his heart on his sleeve and i think that's such a beautiful thing about the way he rhymes so mm -hmm. heaven and hell is the song i haven't heard it in a long time mm -hmm. but that's one that because it wasn't i believe again it was on a soundtrack and it wasn't on one of their albums mm -hmm. that it just wasn't uh might not be as well known okay Cool. Okay. I mean, I I love I love Heaven and Hell. So yes, definitely, I would check that. Um, was it on the soundtrack? It, it was. It was also on Cuban Links. I'm pretty sure as well, right at the end. But that may have been. Oh, okay. That may have been the records we got over because I know there was a few different European and US like different versions. But that's where I remember hearing it. And yeah, I love that song. So yeah, I I, I fully with you on that. Um, but South Man. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I know I've only got this much time with you, so I won't, I won't, I won't give you too much to uh, to dwell on. But um, is there anything else you would like for the guys out there? To is there anything you want to promote? Obviously, you have the book out, and we want to check that. But I see you have a few other things that you mentoring and stuff like that. that I do. I'd like to talk about Unlock Her Potential, which is a program that I founded to provide free mentorship 
for women of color 18 years and older in the United States. Wow. I originally conceived of this years ago, actually, as a consultancy. I wanted corporations, companies to hire me to consult and come in and help to um, train, right, and give women of color the tools to ascend. Because mm -hmm. as you get higher and higher within these companies, those numbers get smaller and smaller. Yeah. And uh, then, you know, less than three months ago, it was mid-June, in the midst of COVID and watching Governor Cuomo every day and looking at the numbers, yeah. um, I decided I'm going to create a program. I know that I have the operational mind. I have the, I, I'm a producer at heart. I know how to put it together. And I secured over 100 mentors in less than three days. Wow. We had... 400 women signing up for updates in a week. We just opened our program on Monday and we already have almost 400 women signing up for mentorship. That's the amazing. list of mentors I think is extraordinary. 50 of them are in TV and film. The next, um, the next largest discipline is music for obvious reasons, then publishing and academia. And then I have folks um, across some other things like law and activism and stuff. Mm. But I think what it speaks to is very, very clearly people understand that this is important. And what I'm trying to do in addition to the program in and of itself is I'm trying to force America's gaze <coughs> I'm trying to force America's gaze at this issue mm. and to understand that there is a dearth of mentorship for women of color and until we start to actively, it's like being actively anti-racist until we start to actively mm. work and mentor women of color, work with them to help them ascend. It's not going to happen at the rate that it should. And I don't think people should have women of color at every level and in the C-suites because it looks good yeah. or, you know, for, because you, because it's politically correct. It's not about that. I mean, mm. I think that Yes, it is the right thing to do. And I think that it impacts your bottom line. 100%. I don't understand how anybody wants to run a company and they have no diversity in there because diversity of thought, I would think, is critical to running an operation. I don't want everybody to look like me. I don't want a bunch of Korean, Canadian immigrants, women mm. talking about this one thing, unless we are specifically talking about the yeah. female yeah. Korean, Canadian immigrant experience, right? Yeah. I want there to be a host of different viewpoints. It can only make it richer. It, it's just counterintuitive to me. Mm -hmm. How could it not, you know, to, to think that all I want is white men to talk about this experience. Yeah. It just doesn't make sense to me. You know, mm -hmm. whatever product it is that you are creating or selling, whether it's technology or something physical, how could you not want diversity of thought? So, mm -hmm. um, I'm really proud. I have an exceptional team of volunteers, uh, a design team, a social media person. I have editors. I have HR professionals. They are all women of color and they all came on and volunteered their time. And they, I, I never could have done it without them. I have this incredible brain trust whom I called immediately as soon as I conceived of the idea. And I would just talk to each of them and they really helped me shape it because, you know, it takes a village. Yeah. Yeah. There, I know I have the idea and I have the mentors, mm. but you know, an idea with that execution is almost meaningless to me. Yeah. Right. And I can't execute without having a team around me. I'm not, mm. I'm not a one woman show. I don't want to be a one woman show. I can't be a one woman show. Otherwise mm. I won't get anything done. Yeah. 100%. And that's the beautiful so thing. So unlockherpotential.com. Unlockherpotential.com. We are, uh, the applications are open until October the 5th. Mm -hmm. And Riza is in there. Jizza is in there. I mean, it's not all famous people by any stretch of the imagination, but there are some extraordinary names in there um, that are all really, really accomplished and have a lot of experience and knowledge to share with, uh, with the mentee. That's amazing. That is amazing. I, I've I've done brief mentoring over a year or two, and I tell you, they're just seeing the real life results of mentoring yes. someone who can't be in an industry that may be creative or media or digital or whatever it is. So, fully, fully big, big ups, man, on that. I, I, I really, really rate that. 
So, Soph, man, thank you for your time. Thank Please, you so everyone. much for inviting me. I really, really appreciate it. No, man, th- we're honoured to have you, man. And it's a, it's a, you inspire us this day, so I'm giving you that, man, definitely. Um, okay. Before you leave us, I was going to ask you what I ask everyone who comes on and steps and talks to me. Um, what's the last great piece of music you listen to? So it could be old, could be new, just the last piece where you're like, oh, yeah, that was amazing. Speaking of amazing, it's a song by Luther Vandross called So Amazing. Oh, wow. Nice. Um, that, yeah, actually, the D'Angelo said, listen to this song. Did he? Wow. Lovely. Well, there you go, people. What a way to end it. Great way to end it. So if, good luck with the book. Good luck with Thank the mentoring. Um, if there's anything else, if there's another memoir, if there's another book coming out, hit us up, man. We'd love to have you on. And Thank um, you so much. And yeah, just just the best of luck and peace be on you, man. And just yeah, hopefully we'll so we catch you soon. Okay. Take care. Thank you for having me. No, not at all. You too. Okay. <laughs> all right. You later. Bye. Peace. Bye-bye. Well, there you go, people. Sophia Chang talking about her memoir, The Baddest Bitch in the Room. And man, we only just touched the tip of the iceberg. That woman has so many stories. There are some very, very heartfelt moments throughout the whole thing. So yes, please go check that out. Uh, Go check out her mentorship program if you're interested, because it sounds amazing to me. I feel like anything like that in the industry is good. And man, one day I would love to do some mentoring for podcasting after that. I love it. So yes, people, hope you enjoyed that. Um, we've got loads more episodes coming up soon go out there check crate808.com check out the merch if you enjoy the dope 90s artwork we've got going on yes please support us it goes all the way back into the pod another thing we're going to be bringing back for the next episode or so is going to be the crate 808 mailbag yes Thank you, people, for getting in touch and telling us the rappers you would love to have crash on your couch for a weekend, uh, the most underrated 90s MCs, uh, the most ridiculous lyrics you've ever heard, all that stuff, crate808 at gmail.com. We appreciate all the correspondence we've got so far. And yeah, man, we're just out here, hopefully going to be bringing you some more flavour. So yes, until the next time, people, go out there, Spin some Luther Vandross, spin some Paul Simon, spin some Rizza, Jizza, ODB, Method Man, Raekwon, Ghostface, whatever it is. Man, let's celebrate this culture. And until the next time, I shall catch you on the flip side. Brap, brap. <laughs> <laughs>